for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2018 Annual Ladies Conference being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Saturday afternoon, February the 17th, 2018. Jerry McKee is the speaker of the afternoon teaching on bitterness. You know, the more deliverance you get, the better you feel. The more you repent, the more deliverance you get. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, let me find my message. <laughs> this message is on bitterness. You could call it the repercussions of bitterness. Some of you have heard it, but you know you need to hear it again. <laughs> Anyway, it'll be a little different this time. You know, let's pray. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your mighty power. I ask you to pour out your mighty Holy Spirit upon every life that you fall upon me and each of those that are here. Lord, we ask that the eyes of our hearts be enlightened. We ask that you know us, let us know the truth that sets us free. Cause us lead until you hear people that are in your word, abiding in your word, so that we know the truth, and the truth sets us free. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you not to let any person go home that without them being born again. In Jesus' name, I ask you to pour your spirit out in the name of Jesus. I pray the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart will be acceptable to you, O God, that I be a tree of life, that rivers of living water come forth from my innermost being. I thank you and praise you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. I ask you to cover this camp, cover Merrill and Barbara, cover uh, Kevin and Patty, cover Rick, Linda. Lord, we ask you to cover Dan and Crystal and the children and every person who works at this camp. Uh, good God, we just thank you for a place where we can come and not get demons. A place where we can come and get rid of demons. We just thank you and praise you for the word that's forever settled in heaven, that you watch over your word to perform it. Thank you that the leaf withers, the flower fades, that the word of our God shall stand forever. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, you are the word of God. We thank you that you sent your word to heal us, not folks. You sent your word to heal us. Praise you that you're the great physician, our healer, our doctor, our deliverer. We thank you, Lord, for our, being our Savior. Thank you, Lord, that you came when we, uh, Lord, when we did, none of us deserve your mercy and grace, but we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, praise you, Lord. Amen. You know, when somebody hurts you, you get angry, or you get hurt, and you get angry. And the Bible tells you in Ephesians 4 not to let the sun go down on your anger. Because you give a foothold to the devil. So in every time in your life, all over your life, as far back as from the time you were a baby, you let the sun go down on your anger, you were held in a stronghold by Satan. So we have a lot of repenting to do, right? How many times did you let the sun go down on your anger? <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> when I, I got saved reading the Bible, I wasn't a church member. All my life I believed in Jesus, I believed in God, but I, did, I wasn't born again until I was 25 years old. Um, I accepted the Lord at the Billy Graham crusade when I was 18 years old, got baptized, kept on cussing, smoking, telling dirty jokes. My life never changed. But when I was born again, everything about me changed. I'm still a, I'm still a work in progress, I'm still getting delivered, I'm still taking off layers, and um, but... When you're born again, you're a new creation in Christ. Old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. But one of the scriptures that I read while I was reading the New Testament, looking for answers, well, I thank God for a grandmother that was in the Word. And she'd say, Jerry, do you read the Word? And I'd say, no, grandmother, I don't understand it. So she said, well, if you'll pray, God will, have, God will and ask God, he'll help, you, he'll help you understand it. So my sister was getting a divorce. So I was, I thought, well, I'll read the Bible and find answers for her problems. Even back then, I wanted to find people's answers to people's problems. <laughs> and that's hard to change gears because when you've been doing this for 35 years, diagnosing people's problems, you diagnose their problems when they don't even want you to. <laughs> it's like carrying a little old lady across the street that don't want to go. 
<laughs> but anyway, you get in a habit, and you know, people don't like it when you already know what their problem is. <laughs> but that's a gift from God, and that's called a sermon, and I thank God for it. And I'm not going to apologize for it, and I'm going to keep on doing it until God tells me not to do it. Amen. <laughs> I want to quit doing it in the arm of the flesh, though. I want to do it as the Spirit directs. Anyway, one of the scriptures I read uh, in the New Testament was, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And I thought, that's what happened to me, because everything about me changed. Two weeks later, I was in the kitchen. I can't even tell you what town I was in, exact place in my house. I was facing east in Lavernia, Texas, which was only about 10 miles from the Sutherland Springs where the, where the, the guy killed all those people in that church. I used to live in that town when I was six years old. It's hot in here. It's the fire of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> anyway, when I read that scripture, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I wasn't a church member. I thought, that's what happened to me. But anyway, a curse word came out of my mouth, a face at east in my little house on Cobb's on Kyle's King Kamehameha Street and in my kitchen a curse word came out of my mouth and I said God that doesn't sound like anything that ought to come out of the mouth of a Christian and God delivered me 55 years ago in my kitchen just through confessing my sin you know God said if you confess your sin he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and so that was one scripture that I read that gave me and, and, I, and after that I thought well, I need to find a church. <laughs> but, but another scripture I read was in Ephesians 4, 6. Don't let the sun go down on your anger because you give a foothold to the devil. And I tell you, the fear of God came on me to not let the sun go down on my anger. So as we were growing up, many, many times when our parents violated the law of God in training us up, the scripture says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And any time they don't, they provoke us to anger. And we may not feel that anger for 50 years from now, um, but it will come out in God's timing. The Bible says that my people will volunteer freely in the day of my power. So I always had a fear of um, letting the sun go down on my anger. And I remember, you know, when the Scripture says, be angry and sin not, it doesn't mean that you have a license to be angry, but it means... You've got till sundown to deal with it, and don't let your anger turn into sin. I used to think it meant to deny I'm angry. You angry your husband, my husband would say, are you angry? No. Are you, well, are you sure? Acting's kind of funny. No, I'm not angry. Are you sure? Well, you've got a funny look on your face. No, I'm not angry. Have you ever done, have you ever done that? <laughs> And uh, anyway, that's what I used to do. I used to think that uh, I had to just pretend I wasn't angry. That's what it meant. But <laughs> I remember one time my husband had gotten into, we got into a disagreement. And um, anyway, I went upstairs and I wanted to go to sleep. But I didn't want to let the sun go down on my anger. So I said, Lord, why should I always have to be the one to say I'm sorry? I think he said he was sorry maybe 10 times in 27 years. <laughs> but I was that was just a, a word that I was always saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I was sorry, all right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, uh, this one particular night, he was mad downstairs and I was mad upstairs. And so I said, well, Lord, uh, this time it's his fault. And the Lord said, yeah, this time it's his fault, but you've got a pride problem. It's good for you just to go and hug to humble yourself again. So I did, and I would say, I'd go down and apologize to him. And he'd say, I'd say, would you please forgive me? No, I'm not going to forgive you because you just keep doing this. And then I get mad all over again. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I can tell you that husband is not alive today because he wasn't quick to forgive. Did you know, God says, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. So if you let the sun go down on your anger, you give a foothold to the devil every time. In other words, you come into greater bondage by not, by not dealing with it by sundown. So you have till sundown to deal with it. And so when somebody hurts you and you let the sun go down on it, and the next day it's unforgiveness, and the next day it's bitterness. God tells us in Matthew chapter 5, 
make friends quickly. Well, first of all, it says don't don't say Raka and don't say you fooled anyone, meaning you're not worth it. Uh, I wish I'd have never met you. I wish you'd never been born. I regret the day I married you, etc. It says you're you're in danger of going into the fiery hell, which if you look that up in the Greek, it means the the final place of judgment for the ungodly. That's what it means. So it's dangerous to let the sun go down on your anger. But God tells us to make friends quickly with our opponent while we're with him on the way, lest he turn us over to the judge. James 1 says that the, or James 1 or 2 says that God is the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, the officer's a demon power, and you'd be thrown in a prison, and it's a spiritual prison. And then it says you'll not come out of there till you pay up the last cent. In other words, until you forgive, you'll still be in that prison. In fact, unforgiveness is one sin that God won't forgive, and, and you won't even have salvation if you don't forgive. It tells us in Matthew 18, uh, the parable of the, of the Lord who had two servants. One owed him about $10 million, and one owed him about $18. And as the parable goes, <clears throat> I'm going to paraphrase, but read it in your own, on your own time. But um, the, the Lord gives an illustration of, a, of a, a righteous judge who had two servants that owed him. One owed him about $10 million and one owed him about $18. And so he asked the one who, the, the, the righteous judge asked the one who owed him uh, $10 million to pay up. And he commanded that his wife and children be thrown in prison. So you see how unforgiveness affects our, the wife and the, the children of whoever won't forgive. So it affects our children. And the Lord had mercy on that slave. And, uh, and then this one that had been forgiven for $10 million goes outside uh, of God's presence and finds someone that owes him $18. And he says, pay up. And the guy says, well, I don't have the money. So he said, so he chokes him and throws him in prison. And so, um, so the Lord's servants saw what this slave had done. So he, they went to the Lord and said, you know, told him what he had done. And the Lord said, you, you um, wicked slave. And he was speaking to, to talk, just telling Peter, you're wicked slave. Uh, you didn't forgive after I forgave you all that debt. Then I'm going to turn you over to the tormentors. And the tormentors are demons that inflict pain. It means the pain of disease. It means an inquisitor. <clears throat> an inquisitor is a jailer that, stre <clears throat> that stretches someone out on a rack and tortures them <clears throat> until they get what they want. So any place you haven't forgiven, you're being tormented by demons 24-7. It's not a good place to be. So don't let the sun go down on your anger. The way you forgive. How many of you have said the, it, forgiveness is not an emotion, it's a choice. You have to choose to forgive. And so when you, um, you don't have to feel like it, you don't have to want to, you don't have to think it's the right thing to do, you, you forgive because you love Jesus more than you love that demon of unforgiveness. If you've ever been to a Milton Green seminar, he used to say, when that demon is talking to you like this, he'd have his hair way out here, and when that demon's talking to you, he said, and when you choose not to forgive, you are choosing to love the demon of unforgiveness more than you love God. And so you choose to forgive. You don't have to feel like it or think it's right. or So you choose to forgive. And so um, forgiveness, if you don't forgive, it means, it means that, for example, I'm sitting on my judge's bench and um, somebody hurts me and I choose to forgive. It means I get off my judge's bench, I walk over to God's courtroom, where he said, as the king of the universe, on his, his, throne, his throne, and I bring my mother and daddy with me, because that's where it started, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But to forgive means the person that you're holding unforgiveness toward, you put him before God's courtroom, and, and God says, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay. And what that means is, you give them to God, you let them go, you let go of your life that you might find it, knowing that the law of the sowing and reaping will catch them. That's how God, that's how his vengeance, it, that's how he takes vengeance, is because what a man sows, he also reaps. Mm -hmm. you, whatever you do, you'll get more later in the same thing, and that's good or evil. And you don't put them in there wanting God to punish them. You put them in there, you let them go, and leave them to God, and you close the door, and you rest your case. 
knowing that the law of sowing and reaping will catch him. However you treat others, you're going to be treated the same way. Jesus said, treat others the way you want to be treated because... He's not only giving you a command, but he was saying, however you treat others is how you're going to be treated. And so, um, I hope that says okay. I hope he's not bumming this, blowing this thing up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it means to forgive. So the Lord showed me one year how to forgive. How many of you have said the words, because you know you have to forgive and you want to do it, and you're doing it in good faith, and you say, I forgive so-and-so, and the day later, you're still arguing what's within your head. Or two weeks later, they, it comes back. It don't go away. You're trying to say, I forgive. You're trying to forgive, but it won't go away. So one day, the Lord showed me what it meant to forgive. I had lunch with someone. We got the disagreement. She said she was sorry. I said I was sorry. And the next day, I was still arguing with her in my head. And I said... Lord, why can't I get over this? She said she was sorry, and I said I was sorry. Why can't I get over this? And the Lord said, she's just like your mother. I said, well, Lord, I don't know what to forgive my mother for. And the Lord said, forgive her for what you don't like about this person. So I started forgiving my mother for being negative and critical and judgmental and with a sharp tongue. I started forgiving her, and it was over. So if you can quickly forgive somebody, it's not a hard issue. But Jesus said in Matthew 18, you forgive from the heart. And the heart is mother-daddy issues. And that's why when you put these people in God's courtroom, the people that hurt you are the same people, are doing the same thing your mother-daddy did that you haven't resolved. It's just giving you a mirror of what you haven't forgiven your parents for. And so... And that's the hard issue. Now, if somebody says, uh, Jerry, forgive me for what I said yesterday. And I say, well, what did you say? Well, I said this, I did that. Well, I looked a certain I didn't pay attention to it. It's not a hard issue. If you can quickly forgive, it's not a hard issue. But if, but if it keeps coming back and you're tormented by the thought of this person continually, you haven't forgiven them. So you've got to forgive. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. And that's, that's how you forgive. And that's very important because unforgiveness keeps us sick. Either we need God to forgive us for something or we need, to for, we need forgiveness. Or we need to forgive someone else. And so, um, so that's why when you put them in God's courtroom, you deal with mother-daddy issues. You know, when somebody gets on your last nerve or hurts you or... or Something just like Ada, what Ada just shared. The reason that it bothered her when Glenn gave her that uh, cleaning stone or whatever that was, it pushed, it triggered her. It pushed a button, a childhood button, because when she grew up, she was treated as whatever. What did you say, Ada? Very unfortunate. Yeah, you were kind of the servant, the slave growing up. You had to do that growing up. So it was a childhood issue. You know, when kids have to do mother and daddy stuff when they're growing up, they miss their childhood and there's bitterness there. I had a lady call me who was a minister from Oklahoma. I don't even know the lady. She said, I'm getting ready to have to have hip surgery. Do you have any insight? And I said, well, when you were growing up, did you have to carry your brothers and sisters on the hip? And she said, yeah, how did you know? And I said, well, the Lord just spoke that to me. You were trained up to carry people like, like Ada was trained up to clean house and be a servant. And that's why. So how are you trained up? Set the default. And that's why we keep get, trying to get out of the default, but we keep getting kicked back into a default. How many of you know what a default is? Like a default on a computer? You can, you can type a letter on a computer using one of two or three hundred fonts, which is the different letter styles. And when you type another letter, the computer kicks it back to the way the factory trained it, or, uh, factory, factory set it. So how you're trained up sets the default. How you trained up is how your life will go till you break the default. And when you forgive, like she said, she was totally healed, she broke the default. She might not have said I break the default, but when we forgive, it breaks things. It resets the, the reaping process. Praise God that, that uh, through Christ we can redeem lost opportunities. Hallelujah. And so that's how we forgive. Uh, the Bible says that there's a throne of grace I can go to. At the throne of grace I can receive mercy and help in time of need. At the throne of grace... 
I get strengthened, confirmed, established, and perfected at the throne of grace. That means when I go through things, if I go to God and say, okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? Then, uh, and, and let him discipline me, which means line me up with the word, correct me. When that happens, I get conformed into the image of Christ. But uh, just say there's a throne of grace here, and I don't go. Uh, there's reasons why I don't go, because parents model for me a picture of what God is like. So when I go through a trial, I may be having a happy day, but when I go through a trial, uh, I take a nosedive, I faint and give up because I don't go to the throne of grace. God has an answer for everything you go through. And so um, when, you, when you go through a trial, the reason you faint and give up and quit and lose heart, and if you're married you want a divorce, um, the reason you do that is because you've got a perverted image of God. If you knew God loved you, He forgave you, He wants the best for you, He wasn't like your daddy, He wasn't like your mother, uh, He wanted to bless you, encourage you, forgive you, accept you, receive you, instruct you, guide you, then if you had a parent that did all those things, it's easy for you to go to God when you have a problem. But if you didn't have a parent like that, you come short of the grace of God, you want to go, but you think He's like your daddy or mother, or there's people that know about it and refuse to go. And so any time, whether it's willful or um, because I think I can't go for some reason, I receive a root of bitterness. I either go to the throne of grace and deal with it God's way, or I come short of the grace of God and I receive a root of bitterness. And bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to die. Because it will absolutely kill you. So how you respond to life circumstances will determine if you get better or bitter. If you get confirmed, confirmed, conformed into the image of Christ, or you get conformed into the image of the one who hurt you, or, in, or to the image of the beast. You know, one of the words for um, in in Revelation nine, it talks about a star that falls from heaven called wormwood, which is bitter, and that's Lucifer when he was kicked out of heaven. He's bitter. Where the bride, the bride of Christ, has a sweet mouth. In the Song of Solomon, the king said, Your mouth is sweet, my darling. But a, but a person that's operating under flesh, not dying to their self, um, they're bitter. The, the scripture says the harlot is bitter. Now, uh, we know what a physical harlot is. But a spiritual harlot is one who, who commits adultery against Jesus, her bridegroom. So there's a physical adultery and a spiritual adultery. And so the harlot is bitter. So you're going to get bitter or better by what you go through depending on who you yield to. If you yield to the Lord, say you don't, you say, well, I'm not going to God. I'm, I'm trying to go to God, but I'm not going to God and I'm not going to anybody. Guess what? If you don't go to anybody, you're going to the devil. You are going either to God or to Satan in your trial. So, go to God. He's got an answer. And like, I don't know who, was it Connie? Connie, you're so cute. I just love you. <laughs> Isn't she cute? She has the cutest personality. <laughs> anyway, and I, and I don't say things I don't mean, okay? <laughs> I may say things you don't like, but I'm not going to tell you a lie. <laughs> you're cute. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know what I was saying, but anyway. <laughs> but how you respond. You know, if you come short, you, if there's a throne of grace and you go to God, you run to God. I'm thankful that I went to, I had a daddy that would take, that I could always go to. A dad and mom that loved me. It was easy for me to go because my dad had an answer whether I wanted it or not. So, but if you, if you grew up in a good a childhood, the childhood where you had a mom and dad that you could go to, and there's lots of you in here that had a parent like I know Lorna had a mom and dad like that. Most of you didn't have a parent like that. Most of you grew up in a dysfunctional family, and that's not criticizing you, but in, my, in our years of deliverance, we, we've learned that our problems, our foundation years, are the years that have molded our life, either good or bad. 
But praise God, it doesn't matter where we've been, what we've been through, God will set us free. But it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. God tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That means when you go through a trial, go to God with it. And if you can't go to God, then forgive your parents for all the negative things you can think about where you've received the lie that God's the same way because he's not. If you have a problem going, then go back and forgive your daddy and mother for giving you a poor image of God. So you go to the throne of grace when you go through a trial. And you get strengthened, confirmed, established, and perfected in that trial. And you get conformed in the image of Christ because you're changing. I can tell you that this arm thing for eight months, it's changed me in some areas that I didn't. I was too blind to see. And so God lets discipline come so it wakes me up. Now, if I go to the world for answers, they give me muscle relaxers or they give me something else or they want to do surgery or something or they... If I let them, then they mess something else up. So um, it's better to go to the great physician. And I, and I can tell you, even since I've been to this camp, it's better. It hadn't been. When, the, the day I came, I would be sitting, and it wouldn't be hurting. And all of a sudden, these muscles here would start uh, tensing up, and it would be like a muscle cramp where I couldn't even bend my arm. And I, that hasn't happened since I've been to the camp. So, praise God. That's victory. It's much better. So, I, did, I haven't gone to the world because I don't want to put a, spir- a band-aid on a spiritual problem. Because you see, if I did go to the world and put a band-aid on a spiritual problem, I'd still have the demon and I'd still have the, the character flaw. You see what I'm saying? So I want God to conform me to the image of the Christ in this trial so I can thank God for this even though it's been painful. And the devil's told me I was going to cripple myself and all kinds of lies, but I don't pay attention to him. <laughs> but praise the Lord. But people will say, well, did you go to the doctor? No. <laughs> but anyway, when you come short of the grace of God, you receive a root of bitterness. And that's where bitterness comes in. And you can't let the sun go down on your anger. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Pursue peace with all men and sanctification without which no man will see God. So, King James says, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see God. Now, God says, be holy as I'm holy, be, per- be perfect as I'm perfect. Well, goodness, does that mean I turn the potter's wheel? No, it means I get on the potter's wheel, which I have one thing to do, yield to the potter. That's what, the clay has one job, and that's to die to himself get on the potter's wheel, and the potter does everything else. And so, um, the sanctification comes as he take, God has taken the junk out. And I thought, oh, and he says, be holy as I'm holy, be perfect as I'm perfect. And so, how I'm holy as he's holy and perfect as he's perfect, is when I die to my flesh and I die to myself, then the character of Jesus is, comes through. And I'm holy and I'm perfect. Because it's his character and nature. Do you understand that? So I don't have to turn the potter's wheel to be holy and be righteous because that's really rebellion because the only place that's not rebellion is submission to his lordship in that trial. Bitterness can be described as dangerous error, a schism, apostasy, which means to fall away from what one person has embraced in their faith. It means a schism, a breach of charity, toward, tending toward to draw people to apostasy, which is to abandon the faith. Uh, it means ill will, grudge, hatred, irreconcilable, anger or passions or emotions. It means sharpness, severity of temper, biting, sarcasm, extreme wickedness. In the Hebrew, bitterness means discontentment. Uh, It can be a feeling of hopelessness. I can't get out of this situation. Um, It's not just a bitter taste in your mouth, but it's also the root of acid reflux. It's also the root of cancer, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that bitterness can bring into our lives. But it's a feeling of despair and despondency. It's unresolved grief, which opens us up, opens us the doorway to bitterness. You know, the Bible says, remove vexation from your heart and put pain out of your body. 
Vexation means anger, sorrow, hurt, provocation, <clears throat> and idolatry because in that trial I didn't go to the throne of grace. I didn't go to God for, for mercy and help in time of need. <clears throat> it's also because I'm, when I'm bitter, <clears throat> I'm very much alive to myself. Is that right? Uh, so it's spiritual adultery because... It's idolatry, and if it's idolatry, I'm committing spiritual adultery against my bridegroom, Jesus. Does anybody have a New American Standard Bible? Or a if you've got a computer where you can get the New American Standard translation? Nobody? Okay. Okay, you do? Okay. <clears throat> In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to read... Um, a Z um, Ezekiel 16, 32 through 41. But I'm going to tell you about Numbers 5. There's a curse of the law of jealousy. In Numbers 5, if a, if a man thought his wife was committing physical adultery, he would take her to the priest, and the priest would take some of the nasty dirt off the floor, mix it with water, and make her drink it. And if she was guilty, her stomach would swell, her thigh would waste away, and um, she would be barren, which means childless. And it could be, you may, you may have committed that sin and you have lots of children. It can be spiritual barrenness, too. <clears throat> One year I was teaching a seminar in Lindale, and a little girl came up to me, and she said, I just had taught on the curse of the law of jealousy. And she said, oh, in fact, it was my little granddaughter. She said, oh, grandmother, my leg hurts. And I broke the curse of the law of jealousy off her, and God healed her knee, her leg. And so, <clears throat> your stomach swells, your thigh wastes away. Okay, now whoever has Ezekiel 16:32, read that to me very loud. 32? Yeah, loud. You need to come up here. Okay. Yes. To 41. Anyway, you're, I'm going to ask you to continue, but I'll just explain. In Ezekiel 16, God's comparing a spiritual harlot to a physical harlot in Numbers 5. But this is talking about a spiritual harlot. A spiritual harlot is a person who commits a spiritual adultery against Jesus because Jesus is going to be your bridegroom. You're the bride of Christ if you're a born-again believer. And so anybody that has other lovers or wants to live after their self, they're committing spiritual adultery. And then um, God is speaking to them in Ezekiel 16 for spiritual adultery. So read on. Men give gifts to all harlots, but you give your gifts to all your lovers to bribe them to come to you from every direction for your harlotry. Okay, stop right there. He's, he's saying right there, a physical prostitute gets paid for what she does. But a spiritual prostitute or a spiritual adulteress, we pay our lovers. In other words, we bake them cakes, we uh, babysit for them, we uh, change our schedule for them, we jump through their hoops, we do whatever because we want them to love us. Right? It's idolatry. Okay, read on. Thus you are different from those women in your harlotry, in that no one slays the harlot as you do, because you give money and no money is given you. Thus you are different. Therefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your doingness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered through your harlotry with your lovers and with all your detestable idols. And because of the blood of your son, which you gave to idols, therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, even all those whom you loved, and all those whom you hated. So I will gather them against you from every direction, and expose your nakedness to them, that they may see all your nakedness. Thus I will judge you like women who commit adultery or shed blood, are judged. And I will bring on you the blood of wrath and jealousy. I will also give you into the hands of your lovers. Turn you over to your idols. Okay. And they will tear down your shrine, demolish your high places, strip you of your clothing, take away your jewels, and will leave you naked and bare. 
They will incite a crowd against you. There's rejection. And they will stone you and cut you to pieces with their sword. They will burn your houses with fire and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women. And then, then, go ahead, I'm sorry. Then I will stop you from playing the harlot. You stop right there. Then I'll stop you from playing the harlot. You see how God's using that discipline? To bring us to repentance, we might say, well, you know, the devil's really attacking me today. Well, guess why? You see what I'm saying? So when you commit a spiritual adultery or physical adultery against your bridegroom of Jesus or physical adultery or spiritual adultery against Jesus, then that's the judgment that comes. <clears throat> and there's a spiritual barrenness that comes. Stomach swells, thigh waste away, and you're barren. And you can be... Uh, if you've committed, let me say this, if since you've become a Christian and become the bride of Christ, you've gone after other lovers, you've shacked up, you've had boyfriends, you've been into sexual sin, you've done this, you've done that, you've backslid, you've done all this stuff, you've committed spiritual adultery and you're under that curse. And so, so it can cause you to be, uh, it can cause you to be uh, physically barren. And there's probably some of you maybe in here that are trying to get pregnant. If you are, you need to break that curse. And I recommend that you uh, repent of all sexual sin. Repent of anything you've done if you've said, I'm never going to have kids. See, some of you had to take care of your brothers and sisters when you were a kid. And you promised yourself, hey, I'm never going to have kids when I get out of this place. And if you've cursed yourself by saying, I don't want children, I'll never have children. And so that's one of the reasons. Another one would be um, something I recommend is to uh, go and do a work study on barrenness. This is what I told a lady to do on Omega Man, and she was she got pregnant, and then uh, she just emailed me and she just told me that she just now lost the baby, but she was like three months pregnant. But my advice to her now is to do a word study on miscarriage. There's a scripture that says, because of God's judgment, give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. So you know, if you couldn't nurse your babies, you could, have, you could be under that curse. So whatever the problem is, look up the word in the Bible. You might not find the disease in the word of God, but you can find the symptoms of your problem in the word of God. So that's why it's so important to be in the word of God. So... Uh, Lord, if I've committed spiritual adultery, and if you've gone after any lover before you've gone after Jesus, you have. And so we can say we're all guilty. So I break the curse of the law of jealousy that would cause my stomach to swell, my thigh to waste away, me to be stripped of my robes of righteousness and my, my ornaments from God to be left naked and bare, people to reject me. And Lord, thank you that you won't let, you know, if you, if you make an idol out of a person, they will reject you every time. How do I know? I've done it. You make an idol out of a person and just watch the rug get jumped out from under you. Because God says you're not having any other gods before me. So you got to let go. As Angie was saying, uh, take it up the mountain. Lay everybody, everything and everybody on the mountain. Give up your life. I'm thankful that God's done a work in my life, and I'm still a work in progress, and I tell you, you can know by this arm, I'm confused, God's got a lot of work to do, but uh, praise God, I thank God for it, but I can honestly tell you that, that at my age, I'm to the place where I really don't want my will anymore, and that's a good place to be, and God has to bring you to that place. I remember that when, when, and when I was 40, I could go through a mall, and everything I saw, I'd want I can go through a mall today and there's not one thing in there I want. That's, God, that's God's grace. That's deliverance. Praise God. So bitterness caused me to be fruitless because I'm living after myself. And John says, every branch in me that, that bears fruit, uh, every branch in me that abides in me that bears fruit, and every branch that doesn't gets cut off. So that can be another thing to examine. Have you been given a death sentence by the doctors? Because sometimes we're getting cut off because we've been fruitless. 
And so we, if, you know, if God knows that when you're going to get out of the hospital, you're going to go back to being a couch potato, why should he heal you? Because he chose you to bear fruit. My mother got uh, ovarian cancer when, in 1978, and she was born again in 1978, and her life was fruitful after that. And she lived from 1978 to, to the year 2000. She died the year 2000, January 2000. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.31 says, <clears throat> Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were called <clears throat> for the day of rege- redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And so whenever I put aside anger, wrath, clamor, slander, my flesh suffers, doesn't it? Because my human nature is to just let it go, let it rip. I need to redo this. Hebrews 4, 4, 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed from through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence... And, you know, you won't have confidence if you've got mother-daddy issues where they've given you a perverted image of God. So deal with, uh, deal with why you don't have confidence to go, because it goes back to mother and daddy. Uh, to the throne of grace, so that you may receive mercy and grace and help in time of need. So in, in all your trials, you'll be either conformed to the image of Christ in that trial or be conformed to the image of the beast. So you're either yielding to God in the trial or you're living, yielding to the devil. Romans 8:28 says, Everything works together for good to those that love the Lord, to the called according to his purpose. And usually we stop right there. And it goes on to say, Whom he foreknew, he, he predestined, to become, be, be, predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ. So if when you go through a trial, it's not going to work for your good, the good here is getting conformed to the image of Christ. So everything works together for good if you're being conformed to the image of Christ is what that's saying. But if you get bitter in that what you're going through, it doesn't work for your good. In fact, you're conformed to the image of the beast. First Corinthians chapter 8 talks about wounding people through food. What, what food you eat, being a stumbling block to a weaker brother. <clears throat> and basically, when we uh, are a stumbling block, to, we wound somebody's conscience. by. And it's talking about food in First Corinthians chapter 8. But uh, how much more if we get, we're sexually molested or we're, uh, we go through a dysfunctional family or we are hurted or we're hated or abandoned uh, in that trial? If somebody wounds us uh, through molesting, molestation, it's what they do is they cause me to pattern after them. That word wound their conscience means to pattern it after. It'd be like if I go up and put a muddy hand on that white screen there. I'm... I'm um, I'm still instilling my imprint. And so that's why breaking soul ties is so important. It's because through soul ties, we get a part of whoever wounds us, and they get a part of us. And so that's why we need to break soul ties. Romans 2, 1 says we become like who we judge. Now that's a sobering thought, isn't it? Um, and so until you and I forgive, uh, it. The people that we are bitter toward are hanging around our neck through a soul tie. That's why we're tormented. And so what God, God allows in my life is for my transformation and for my change. And I just cover us with the blood of Jesus. And I tell you, devil, you're not going to put anybody to sleep. I bind the spirit of Leviathan in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. <clears throat> The scripture says that we're counted all joy when we go through various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. Scripture goes on to say we have need of endurance, and after we've done what the will of God says, we um, will receive what's promised. So it may take a long time. It seems like my whole life I've been waiting for things. And see, I was trained up to wait. My mother and daddy had a grocery store, a gas company, a um, uh, help yourself laundry, uh, you name it, and I was always waiting for them with a clothes shop. 
I'd go to school and I'd say, Mother, come get me. She'd say, that's me coming around the corner. 30 minutes later, Mother, come get me. You can see I was very kind of a bossy daughter, (laughs) which I've repented of. Mother, come get me. I'd be so irritated. And then 30 minutes later, she still wouldn't come. Well, I'm on my way. And so my whole life, and, and guess what? Because I was trained up to wait, wherever I go, I had to wait. I get the dumbest waiters in the restaurants usually. I get the most incompetent people. And a few days ago, I thought I was so dead, and I talked to AT&T. And I'm telling you, I came alive. (laughs) My flesh was not dead. Jerry McGee, oh my goodness, I've not been so mad in my whole life. And it never fails. See, you know what? God's going to keep putting me through that test until I pass it. (laughs) If there was another telephone company to go to that wouldn't take uh, three weeks to get everything straightened out, I'd already change it. Change I mean, you can be in a good mood, thinking just having a happy day to you call AT and T or Verizon or excuse me, excuse me, get to that stupid computer. <laughs> oh my goodness! It's like, this is what I want. Excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> Anyway, God, I'm not proud of that. I ask you to deliver me. I just wanted to be real, okay? (laughs) So the issues that have you distressed today are the same things you didn't deal with as a kid. I hope hope if you won't forget that. What distresses you today is mirroring what you didn't deal with when you were a kid. So God lets people mirror what he wants to change in us. So the purpose of your trial is that that um, we can respond. See, that one of the purposes, God doesn't want me to react to the politicians. He wants me to respond in the Holy Spirit. Yes. So that's when we go through the trials. is because God's trying to work the meanness out of us. He's trying to work the unforgiveness out, the bitterness, the, the self-confidence, the judgmental heart, the wrong attitudes. <clears throat> So that's why in your trials that you've got to go to God and you've got to deal with it. And I've asked God to forgive me for all the things I just confessed, okay? So he wants us to operate out of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you get healed, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of areas. I can say that, you know, I can talk to people. People don't wound me anymore. I mean, God's so delivered me. But now AT&T and the politicians are getting me. <laughs> I mean, you can't hurt my, none of you can hurt my feelings. Or like Lauren and I, we grew up like heckle and jekyll. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Matches and gasoline. <laughs> we pretty much agree on most things, but there's one area we don't agree on. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know what? She doesn't make it doesn't make me mad. Now she's not delivered enough that I don't make her mad. But she, I don't. <laughs> but, but what I'm telling you is, got because I've been dealing with these things for years and years and years. People can't hurt my feelings anymore. Uh-huh. Now, my kids might hurt my feelings, but I've got a son that never, he's always kind and gentle and sweet to me, even when I'm not. <clears throat> but uh, but I haven't got over and got delivered from AT&T yet. I don't want to talk to him tomorrow, okay? <laughs> Those of you who have, have called AT&T, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And so we're either reacting or responding, and I've been reacting to the politicians, but now I'm not. See, I've got delivered from that. You know, God gets you delivered, and then he shows you something else you need to get delivered from. (laughs) So God will keep allowing the Holy Spirit, and it's like with this AT&T thing, every time I call A&T, I mean, it's the same old thing because I haven't got over it. God will keep allowing conflict in that area that he's trying to change in you till you change. Yeah. Right? He will do that. <clears throat> so until I come to the throne of grace and get totally delivered. But uh, I want to stay dead, so I'm going to stay away from the phone. For... 
<laughs> no, I'm going to overcome this, honestly. One time I got so mad, I got uh, I got some other country. And I had the phone like this. It was somebody computer program or something. And I got India or someplace. It was like this. I got a crick in my neck. <laughs> I said, okay, Lord, what did I do? He said, you got angry at that person. You see what I'm saying? You hold your neck like this and you're angry. Guess what? Neck problem. <laughs> Always ask God what the problem is. He's got an answer. And then if he don't answer you, ask him why he's not answering you. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 8.1, all the, God's telling the, the Israelites <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 8, chapter 8, He's telling them, and we are the Israel of God. We're the spiritual. We're spiritual Jews, and it says that in in Galatians three, uh, where it says everybody's in Christ, it's been baptized in Christ is Israel. It says it in Romans um, nine, in Galatians three, and other places that we are the spiritual Israel of God. Amen. <clears throat> so whatever he told the children of Israel applies to us today. So Deuteronomy eight one, all the commandments that I'm commanding you today. You should be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God swore to give to your forefathers. You shall, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these, in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you, testing you to know what's in your heart, that whether or not you're going to keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you do not know, or did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he told Satan, he rebuked Satan by saying, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we got to live by the word of God, not our own thinking. Deuteronomy 8 tells you why the Lord leads us in our circumstances, which are, is our wilderness. That he might humble us. This has been humbling. He uses things to humble us all the time. That he might humble us, prove us to know what's in our heart, know if we're going to keep his commandments or not. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.